So to give you the overview of the four chamber view, the four chamber view is important. You have to simply try, see and learn. Use contrast if you do not see the endocardial borders, if you want to find thrombus in patients with coronary artery disease, with hypertrabeculations, with masses, tumors. Use contrast if you are not sure. Use contrast to detect aneurysms, pseudoaneurysms. And the shape and the form of the ventricle, of the left ventricle, already gives away a lot of information of what the underlying pathology you're dealing with looks like. And very important for the future views, keep the left ventricle in the center. So if you want to go to two-chamber view and an apical long axis view, keep the left ventricle in the center and not, as it is sometimes written, the interventricular septum. Because if you rotate around the septum, you will always lose the chamber. But if you have the chamber in the center of the image and you rotate towards the two-chamber view, 90 degrees or 60 to 90 degrees counterclockwise, you will always get the left ventricle and the left atrium in your field of view. I want to discuss some atypical views. So not always you can see everything with the four chamber view optimally. Then it is time to move the transducer. You can move medially so that you see the lateral parts of the left ventricle better, so the anterior lateral wall. You have here the traditional four chamber view. And if you move more laterally and tilt inwards, so here you can tilt from the medial position a bit outwards, so laterally, and here you move laterally and tilt inwards, you get a nice glimpse of the right ventricular free wall. So you can move around the transducer, you can relocate the transducer and tilt to optimize your views and to get specific views for specific structures you want to see. So in case of the medial view, you have to really differentiate and delineate the anterolateral wall. It is good to find defects of the septum and also of the atria because there's a little bit of tilting involved. So you see jets probably better. And of course, for wall motion abnormalities. And in case of the right ventricle, move laterally. And you see here the free wall of the right ventricle. It even makes the measurements way easier. So here's the right ventricular and the left ventricular apex. So you should focus on those regions to truly delineate and depict the RV free wall to measure the strain, the S prime, and of course the TAPSI. Here are the examples where you see the various transducer positions. Here you have the more medial view where you see the anterolateral lateral wall, the traditional four chamber view, and here the focused view of the right ventricle where you see the free wall of the RV. The beam orientation, of course, is key. So you can also adapt the beam orientation as you can see here. Here the apex of the right ventricle is not seen. When the beam orientation is adapted and optimized, you can even see the apical regions of the right ventricle. So by means of beam orientation, you can use that and still use strain imaging. The beam orientation or also other features by means of changing the imaging or the angulation of the imaging, it doesn't really affect your measurement. So in this case, you still can use the TDI measurements, the S prime, the TAPSI in this area, and also the right ventricular free wall strain. So if you cannot see all the structures, Keep in mind that you also can optimize beam orientation. Some structures I also want to mention because I do think they are important to visualize are the pulmonary veins. So overall, they are not always easy to find, but with, of course, better and better machines, it becomes easier to visualize them. It becomes easier to measure. Keep in mind that there are four in a normal anatomical setting, the left Pulmonic veins, you can see here the left lower and here the left upper. And here, of course, measurements make less sense compared to the right upper pulmonic vein, because here you see the beam orientation is simply optimal. The right lower in TTE, from my experience, it's not possible to find. Also in TE, it's sometimes very difficult to visualize all four pulmonary veins, but at least keep in mind that the right upper can be visualized and used for measurements optimally. So if you do that, you see here a structure, a vascular structure. Here's another structure, but that might be the left atrial appendage. But in this case with color Doppler, we do see that there is flow coming into 
the left atrium. Here you see the blood flow. Of course, this is not optimal for measurements, Doppler measurements, of course. So we have to find here another structure that must be the right upper pulmonary vein. And now optimizing towards the right upper pulmonary vein and placing the pulsed wave Doppler, we get a signal. We have an S wave and a D wave. So a systolic and a diastolic wave. Sometimes we have an additional notch here in the S wave. And so the S1 and the S2. But in this case, we have a nicely depicted S wave and a D wave. Normally, the S wave is larger than the D wave. In this very young, healthy and fit individual, the D wave is a little bit higher than the S wave. This could be a finding in young and healthy athletes. But normally, when you see it in an elderly patient, it also can show elevated feeling pressures. And that's what the pulmonary veins are actually for. They show the overall entering of blood flow into the left atrium and therefore are involved in elevation of feeling pressures. And here you have the old nomenclature of feeling pressures of diastolic dysfunction. But overall, what you can nicely see is that there are several measurements we have. We, of course, have our pressure curve, which rises initially when we have a restrictive filling pattern and the mitral inflow, the E to A ratio, here the very high E and the small A wave in this restrictive filling pattern and the IVRT, the isovolumic relaxation time. You can also go watch the entire video of diastolic dysfunction where also the IVRT, the isovolumic relaxation time is featured. For a ground rule, the IVRT has a certain length and it becomes really short. It depicts also elevation, significant elevation of filling pressures. And the pulmonary venous flow is the same. We have the S wave, the D wave, and we have another segment which is called AR. That's a reversal of flow. And the more the flow reversal is, the higher the filling pressures are. And you see that the S wave compared to the D wave becomes significantly smaller, which also depicts elevation of feeling pressures. The AR is also a good sign. So if you have a young, healthy athlete, you do not want to see a prominent AR wave, but really just a small, as you can see here, reversal flow. But the S and the D wave, as I said, in young, healthy, fit individuals can look a little bit different by means that the S wave is a little bit smaller than the D wave. Furthermore, we have the mitral annular velocities, the E prime measurements and the corresponding towards the A wave, the A prime, but we look at the E prime mostly and here we see the E prime in these various settings where the feeling pressures are elevated. The lower the E prime is also compared to the E to E prime ratio of the restrictive feeling pattern. It shows elevation of feeling pressures. Now you see here again with the naming of the individual curves. You have here the S wave, the D wave and this small insignificant area. We have the AR in this young healthy person. 